All right. Uh, so thank you so much, Steve. Uh, my name is Steve Perchniewski. I'm a, a tech market engineer on the Storage Grid team. Uh, so Storage Grid is NetApp's on-prem software-defined uh, object store, right? So the data management platform for unstructured data. Um, it's a really exciting time. We're seeing a lot of transition in this market and a lot of, of rapid growth. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it, and I'll tell you a little bit about where we see the market going. So today, I mean, and the traditional area for object storage has been cold archive. So naturally, when you think object storage, you think about backup, you think about uh, the, you know, the joke is the write once, read never workload. And for a long time, that's true. Um, but we see kind of some new workloads growing here. In the green bubble, we're talking about active archive. And, and what we mean by that is applications that are speaking S3 as their primary API, and then are storing, of course, in S3. Uh, good examples of this would be like Splunk Smart Store. So there, it's an application that is tiering to object storage. It's for kind of a warm or a cool bucket, and it's going to read those It's going to read that data back. Another example would be NetApp data fab uh, NetApp's Fabric Pool product. So that's where we are tiering off of our all flash array to an object store. Again, we're, we're moving it downstream, but we still expect good performance, SATA-like performance, and we're going to read those objects back. So as we move from the left side to the right side, it's not that the cold archive bubble is shrinking, but it's getting smaller in relation to the active archive. So to applications that natively speak S3. So as, as new engineers are coming out of college and, and joining the workforce, this is what they've been writing applications for. This is what they expect to see. Um, in the past, when object stores were deployed, they were typically deployed for a single purpose. They were sized for, for backup. They were sized for medical imaging. Now what we see is our customers are purchasing it maybe for a single purpose, but very quickly finding another use case for it. And because of that, we need to be more flexible. We need to be able to support multiple workloads. We need to be able to treat different data differently depending on access patterns, depending on object size, depending on performance requirements. And so we see it can no longer be kind of a monolithic object store. It's no longer as simple as it once was. The other area that we really see growing is analytics. So object storage kind of answered the question of how do I manage petabytes and petabytes of data with a low work, with, with a small staff? And now we're asking the next question, right? How do we drive value out of that data? And analytics is the answer. So we've got uh, the Hadoop S3A connector. We see Microsoft with their big data clusters in this space as well. So again, we think that's going to be really key. As we're storing more and more data here, we're going to want to take advantage of it. So what do we think we need to do to kind of move to where the object storage world is going, right? As we've moved from this traditional, very dense, very you know, cold archive, how do we, how do we adapt? Um, it's going to be about higher performance, right? So again, you know, we're going to read these objects back. We're going to want to utilize them, both for ingest and retrieve, which is obvious. But what's maybe a little less obvious is delete. So for a long time, object stores essentially assumed you were never going to delete anything. And if you were going to delete something, it was something we could get around to when we had time. We're seeing now from vendors when we're doing certification tests that they have delete performance requirements. So they're literally giving us something like, hey, you need to delete 10 million objects and get it done in under an hour or something like that. Um, so these are somewhat demanding. And Storage Grid is actually really good at this because of the way our architecture is. We've actually had customers that are coming to us now and saying, I'm going to ingest a whole bunch of objects. I'm going to keep them for X amount of time. And then I need to delete them within a certain amount of time. And this actually changes the way we have to size an object store. It's, it's a different thing for an object store to do. So flexibility is going to be key, right? So you know, frankly, while we <coughs> think we know what's coming down the road and we can make predictions based on what we've seen from our customers so far, we don't. Uh, so we need to be flexible. We need to be able to, to handle what's coming next, even if it's unknown. So the idea of supporting mixed workloads and multiple tenants is really important. So mixed workloads, it could be you know, tiny objects and large objects. In the past, we would always kind of size for one or the other. And we find now that we need to maybe size for both, depending on the customers. So the typical workflow is a customer may buy you know, storage grids specifically to do Commvault backups. And then their in-house dev teams discover they've got S3 on-prem, and they go ahead and write a whole bunch of applications. And now they've got a whole new workload with new requirements. So the ability to treat different data types with different policies that I can change over time is really key. So I can treat my Commvault uh, workload one way, and I can treat my small object workload that's coming from imaging an entirely different way. So those granular data protection policies, the ability to put data in the right place at the right time. And a lot of times with object, perform with object storage, performance is about keeping the object in the right place at the time. So storage grid is a multi-site 
uh, object store. If I've got customers in Asia Pack, I'm going to keep my data close to them. If I'm doing something like a content distribution network where I'm putting media all over the world, the ability to have my media files at the right place in time, like say, for instance, um, if I'm a karaoke company and I want to make sure that my songs are, you know, full copies at every data center, when that song is popular, that's a big difference. And then maybe after <laughs> everyone sings it for 30 or 60 days, maybe I pull it back to my lowest cost data center. So the idea about data placement <clears throat> can be about performance, but can also be about cost. So NetApp, we of course use storage grid internally. We have three data centers. We've got Sunnyvale, where we're at today, which is our most expensive real estate. <clears throat> so the cost per floor tile is very expensive in terms of power and cooling, and just sheer real estate. And then we've got Oregon and North Carolina, and they're really low cost. So for us, if we want to be low cost, our default policy is going to be a copy in Oregon, copy in North Carolina. And actually, it turns out that our <coughs> lowest cost is to do a single erasure coded copy in Oregon. So when something really gets cold and we just want to keep it because we're required to, we'll go ahead and keep it in Oregon. So the ability to create policies like that and then change them over time is key. The ability to adapt to new requirements and regulations, right? So our customers are constantly being you know, challenged with new business requirements. Maybe they acquire another company or a new data center. Or there's a new regulation that they have to adhere to. Um, I'm getting a lot of mileage out of the Brexit example, and I'll, we'll dig into that further on. But that's actually something that's looming for some of our customers. They've got data that's stored in the UK that has to be stored in the EU, and they're going to have to deal with that should Brexit actually ever finally happen. So the other part is about simplicity and agility, right? So just like the cloud is easy to use, we want to make that same experience of on-prem object storage simple. The ability to easily deploy a tenant, to give them their keys, to create a policy for them. We want that to be the same. So by using <coughs> standards, the same tools that our customers are used to using with Amazon AWS, they can now use storage going on-prem as well. So we make a, a very concerted effort never to do anything that's proprietary. We only do things that will work with that common tool set that Amazon gives you. And lastly, low-touch operations. So this is something that's really important, right? You're managing petabytes and petabytes of data. You need to be able to do it with a small staff. So one of our largest customers, um, ProSiebenSat, it's a media company in Germany, they're managing, I think it's well north of 50 petabytes, <clears throat> just one, well, I think it's actually half a person. So it's quite low-touch. So what is Storage Grid? So Storage Grid is NetApp's on-prem, software-defined uh, data management for unstructured data. It is an object store that speaks the S3 API as well as the Swift API. By default, it is multi, it's multi-site. Most of our customers would want to do at least two sites. It can be done in a single site. The example here I'm showing, I've got a site in New York, San Francisco, Munich, and Tokyo. And then the key thing here is I can create these data management policies, such that maybe I'm pinning data that has to stay in the EU at my Munich data center, or maybe my financial data in New York close to my financial analysts. Or, you know, again, maybe it's lower cost to run in one of these data centers. So it's about cost, it's about performance, and it's about hearing to regulations. Hey, why do people run, <clears throat> excuse me, why do they run multiple sites other than location? Because when you said that initially, I was assuming you were meaning they were running multiple sites in order to give them some sort of geodispersal of the data. It's but you can't do that if your requirement is to put all your... You, EU data in Munich. You, right. can't, you can't geodisperse some of it to I can't, other Absolutely locations. right. And so that's, I'm actually going to show in the demo how I create a rule that will pin EU data to the EU. So I can say um, I have a metadata tag that says location equals EU. That data has to live in Munich. So while this will all be managed as one big grid, I can actually pin that data specifically where I have to to adhere yeah, to that. So that means Munich needs to have enough resilient infrastructure to survive <laughs> as Munich. That's, that's true. So that's a good point. So that's one question we always ask our customers. How resilient does this data need to be? Tell me about the type of failure you want to have. So for instance, what I would probably do is I would do intra-site erasure coding within Munich so that I don't have a single copy. So Storage Grid will let you do a single copy of data. We wouldn't recommend that. Object storage people tend to be way more paranoid about things than anybody else. So while even though our nodes are resilient and have you know, built-in resiliency within the node, we would never say, unless it's an ephemeral workload, <coughs> in some cases that's OK. Right? So for example, we have developers that are beating on Storage Grid all the time developing NetApp's products. And the test data that they do is ephemeral. I don't want to waste network resources pushing it all over the place. I don't want to waste disk resources. So for them, I might say, let's do a single copy. So yeah, we can do it. You absolutely would want to make sure that it was protected, even if it was pinned to a single site. Or maybe I'd be running multiple sites within Germany to make sure that that data is, is there. What we saw, especially Europe was our first early adopters. So and we'll get into kind of the history of storage grid in another slide. But because of the data locality rules, they were some of the first to adopt it versus just using Amazon. 
So it's kind of hard to see here. I've got kind of this gray box here. And what I want to represent is that you know, I'm able to put all these different resources behind Storage Grid and behind these policies. So you can deploy Storage Grid on our hardware appliance. Um, so here I'm showing our SG-1000 load balancer admin node and then our all flash node. But you can also deploy on VMware and software only. So this is where you pick one of these flavors of Linux, deploy Docker, deploy the software. You can, of course, use NetApp storage behind this, but you can also use third-party storage. So again, it's software-defined. All the features that you can get in our hardware, you can also do within the software. And lastly, hybrid cloud workflows are a really big deal. So at Insight the other week, I kind of did an informal poll with all of my sessions, and I would ask them, who's running Amazon? Who's running Azure? Who's running Storage Grid? Or are you running another private cloud? And this is very non-scientific, but most of the hands went up. It seems like most of our customers are taking a multi or hybrid cloud approach to their object storage. So we want them to be able to use the right resources in the right place. Um, that's the whole idea behind NetApp's data fabric, is that we're going to use open standards and let you decide what the right resources are, and then we're just going to help you manage them. So we can use capacity in Amazon and in Microsoft Azure and Glacier, so we can absolutely treat this almost like another site. We can go ahead and, and create a policy that says, I'm going to keep a certain data subset in Azure or in uh, Amazon. So if, if you don't take anything else away from, from this session, this is kind of the big deal. It's our idea of flexible data management, what we call ILM policies. That stands for Integrated Lifecycle Management. It's the ability to create a policy that can be as granular down to a single object that does what I want to do with it and then treats it different from other objects. So the idea is that the value of your data or the way you access your data over time is going to change. So maybe within the first 30 days, I'm accessing things very frequently. I want to keep those as a replica at all of my sites. And after that time, I'm going to move it to an erasure code copy over uh, you know, geo-distributed. <coughs> So I want to define how durable it is, how many, how many losses do I want to take before I lose that object. Again, if it's like contract data that I'm legally required to keep, I want to make sure that's really durable. If it's ephemeral data that my developers are cranking out, I don't want to waste a lot of resources on it. We can define performance by pinning it to either a higher performance site or just by keeping it closer to our consumers, right, by having <coughs> lower latency. And then the idea of cost of storage is important too. So it's, it's cost of storage both in terms of you know, how dense is my storage, but again, it can also be about the different cost of data centers. You know, for, for NetApp, it's gonna be, let's keep things in Oregon. The other idea is that we can enforce retention. So we can actually create a, a worm policy that's SEC compliant, where we'll say you can't delete this object, you can only extend the retention on it. Uh, we can also invoke legal hold on those objects. So we've touched on this a bit already, but the ability to geofence or keep objects within a certain data center uh, for purposes of adhering to regulations, for purposes of keeping it close to our consumers is key. That's really what has set us apart from a lot of our competitors, and it's why we saw that early adoption in, in Europe. And then we can even go a step further and create conditional policies where we can say things like, from a certain subnet, I have full read-write privileges. Maybe from every other subnet, it's just read-only, or maybe even deny. So we can get really granular in where the data is stored and even how it's accessed. And then here's the big one, right? If I create these policies and then something changes, I can modify those policies and they will change it, right? So I create a, a rule that says erasure code every object that's over 10 megabyte in size, and maybe I find that due to intersite latency, that's not a good idea. I can change that policy to go to replica. Every new object that comes in the system gets that new policy. And then over time, we'll go back and find all the other objects and then bring them into compliance with the rule set. So we've got what's called our scanning ILM engine, or it's our policy engine. So we're constantly checking every object in the system, making sure there's no bit rot, making sure it matches that MD5 hash that we created when we adjusted it. And then we're also checking to see if it's in compliance with our rule set. And again, we've got the ability to choose to do that. So by default, I change that rule. Any new things that comes into the system get that rule set, and then things that exist will be brought into compliance. But I can also set a time rule that says, I don't want to do things that were within the last year. I want to go ahead and wait or something like that. So we can be very granular there. And then the last thing is because we have these powerful rules, we want to be able to apply them granularly. Think about we can almost create like a, a service catalog for our storage tenants to choose. So we can say, hey, if you want to pin your data to a certain data center, you can put a metadata tag on it that says location equals that data center. I can create custom regions. So I can say, hey, if, when you create your bucket, if you want to make sure that I keep your data in New York, use my New York region, right? So just like Am when you create a bucket in Amazon, you specify that region. Within Storage Grid, I can create custom regions. And of course, I can also mimic the same regions that Amazon has as well. 
So we like to show this to customers. We're very proud of it, right? Storage Grid has a long history. It was acquired from a company called Bicast that was founded. Um, I think they were founded in 99. Their first production deployment was in 2001. So we've actually got almost two decades of production deployments under our belt. So when you are deploying an object store, it is something that's probably going to be around for decades, right? It's a pretty big commitment. You're putting petabytes and petabytes of data into it. It'll give you a warm fuzzy to know that you're you know, dealing with a company that's been at this for a long time. So when, storage, when NetApp acquired Storage Grid, right, we knew they already did all the important things right. They were really good at data integrity. They knew how to do replication. They had this you know, multi-site uh, you know, <coughs> ability to replicate built in. Around 2014, it became apparent that the S3 API was you know, the one true object storage API to rule them all, and we adopted that. Prior to that, we had been pushing for an open standard called CDMI. A lot of other <coughs> vendors, including us, supported it, but it didn't really see good adoption. So the S3 API really brought this to the forefront, and with the you know, just wealth of applications that are being built for it, it really started to drive uh, adoption. So we've got this long history, but we've also now committed to doing two releases a year. So this is a rapidly evolving space, and frankly, you know, we're trying to keep up with Amazon. As they introduce new features, we want to adopt them as rapidly as possible to keep up. And this is what our customers expect. So uh, the release that we just did in the fall uh, is 11.3. This was announced at Insight two weeks ago. Um, we introduced our all-flash appliance, and we also introduced what we're calling the SG-1000 services node. And I'll get into those in the next couple slides. So this has kind of been you know, our guiding uh, mantra here. We want to make things really simple. So object storage in the past has been you know, traditionally really difficult to deploy. right? It's always been a professional services engagement. Uh, we are making it simple to deploy, simple to consume, simple to live with over, over the long haul. Um, so we want to enable streamlined installation, no matter which platform you're on. And we also want to enable low touch operations. So everything we do is, is API driven. We do APIs first. I'll show you that in the demo. All the things that you can do within the UI, you can invoke through the API so that you can automate them. And then scale is really important too, obviously, right? So customers are going to want to store, you know, up to hundreds and hundreds of petabytes in this. This is where it makes a lot of sense versus keeping it in the cloud for terms of cost. So having a massive distributed namespace makes sense. And then we're also extending that to the cloud. So we're able to use resources from the cloud. We essentially will keep the metadata for those objects on-prem. but We can now use capacity in the cloud. And we're also enabling our tenants to use resources in the cloud with what we call platform services. And then finally, we want to help our customers go faster, right? So we're introducing that all-flash <laughs> node. And we're introducing, uh, we've been optimizing for Fabric Pool. So Fabric Pool, again, is, is NetApp's product where we're tiering from our all flash array to Object Store. But effectively, what we're doing to be efficient for Fabric Pool is doing a better job of range reads. So range read is when an application essentially gives you, you know, one big object and then only wants a piece of it back. A lot of backup vendors do this, right? So they'll put together, you know, a 10, 15 meg object, give it to Storage Grid. And then when they want to do a restore, they only want a piece back. So we've optimized that ability to find that object, to read that first packet, and then scrub inside it to get that thing. So in the past, we had always talked about this in media. You know, I'm uploading you know, a three gig movie, and now I only want to watch minutes 65 through 72, it's scrubbing inside that. But with things like Fabric Pool and Commvault and Rubrik, they're doing this a lot, right? They're saying, give me this little chunk of data. I need to pull it back and do something with it. So by getting faster for Fabric Pool, we improved things for a lot of other applications. Steve, um, on the old flash appliance, um, question on performance. I mean, we don't really have any benchmarks with object stores to be able to measure right. and compare them. Um, how are you demonstrating performance of your old flash appliance and the need for that? Right. Uh, like, for, for example, you know, multi-streaming or the ability to ingest objects rapidly or right. whatever it happens to be and demonstrate why all flash becomes relevant. It's really about low latency with all flash. That's where we're getting <coughs> the most benefit today. And then there's a lot of, frankly, a lot of headroom in that appliance too. Um, I think I'm covering it on an upcoming slide. So yeah, we have not published a lot of performance benchmarks. Um, when we do tests, we use our own internal testing tool called, it's not internal, actually we published it, on, published it on GitHub. It's called S3 Tester. And we're actually trying to encourage other vendors to use it. It's open source. It's not proprietary to storage grid in any way. It's a very simple and easy tool to use. And then we also uh, use GitHub. GitHub, or not GitHub, we use Cosbench as well, um, which is kind of the standard. So typically what you'll see um, when we do um, a POC where another object store is involved, they will run Cosbench against us, and then we'll <coughs> compare it to the others. Um, the benefit for all flash is, is really about lower latency. So there's that, that metadata lookup that happens for every object, and when you've got a lot of small objects and you're doing those lookups repeated and repeatedly, the lower we can get latency, the better performance you'll see. But that, that's more a metadata thing than it is the actual <coughs> content then. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that you, your, all your metadata is just dispersed across 
all of the it, The metadata storage. is dispersed across the nodes. And so if you can, what you would do is actually, and I'll cover this in an upcoming slide, you actually create one site that's all flash so that your, all of your metadata for those objects is contained within that ring so you're gonna get a really fast, both a fast commit when I do that write as well as a fast response when I do that read back. So for this release, you know, to make things simpler, we're introducing this SG-1000 <coughs> node. It is a load balancer, right? We don't intend to compete with or replace F5 or Citrix, but because we're getting into new customers where they don't have a load balancer, for them to go and buy an F5 is a heavy lift. It, it, if, they don't, if they have another application where they're using it, it makes a lot of sense. But a lot of our new customers, this is the first application they've ever seen where they need a load balancer. And so for us to give them one that works out of the box, that's essentially pre-configured for them with all the health checks built right into it, that's a big advantage. So we do have a, a tech report out on the web if you Google storage grid and load balancer, and it tells you how to configure a health check for F5 and for HA proxy and, and Netscaler. And we at NetApp actually use F5 today for our production instances but we're introducing this, it makes things simple. And the other thing it does is it allows us to run the admin node in, a, in our appliance as well. So in the past, we, if we did an appliance grid, we'd have the appliances, and then you'd have to run the admin node in a container or on a VM, and the customers are saying, like, I don't want to do a hypervisor, I don't want to send any traffic through VMware, I just want to have an all appliance grid. So the experience of installing the appliance is incredibly easy, right? I'm, I'm, I rack it, I stack it, I give it an IP, I configure my VLANs, and I'm done. Um, when I do VMware, I have to provision storage to VMware. It's a little more complex. And if I do bare metal, of course, I'm installing the OS and installing Docker, and, and all those things can be automated through Ansible, but you, you do have to be good at that. So with this one, it's, it's highly simple, right? We're getting to the point where you, you know, don't even need to be a Linux admin. So I'll cover a little bit more about that in an upcoming slide, too. And then to scale, to get bigger and bigger, we are introducing a multi-shell SG6060. So last fall at Insight, we introduced essentially this, right? So it's this external compute node plus a 60 drive shelf. Um, there are two SSDs in there for metadata caching. And what we're introducing now is the ability to, at point of sale, have three shelves. So we can get up to two petabytes in a single appliance. So in very large object workloads, this makes a ton of sense. And then, again, that SGF 6024, which is our all flash appliance. So again, a little bit of a deep dive into the SGF uh, 6024. Um, it's geared at high performance, low latency, small object workloads. Um, this is where we think it's going to be most applicable. We actually had customers who were essentially building these on their own. And now we've you know, kind of caught up with where our customers are and we've, we've now productized it. Um, we can put 15 terabyte SSDs into it and get a total of, of 367 terabytes raw in it. And I'll, I'll show you in an upcoming slide kind of the architecture that we would do. Essentially, we would put all of these in a single site together so we've got that really fast metadata response and really low latency across all of those. So, Steve, th this looks like, like a FAS with a server on top. Um, it's an uh, E-series with a, with a server okay, on top. Okay, an E-series then with a, with a server on top. Yes. Um, why not just rack more E-series um, and um, and have the data sort of resiliently done in like a rack scale version, then then yeah. deploy as nodes that are a server and storage, server and storage, server and storage. So you could do that, right? It's high opt. This <coughs> is, is optimized, right? So when you plug this in, it automatically reaches across, sees the storage, configures it for you. So this was going to be where you're going to need more compute and less storage, but you could absolutely, if you chose to, build your own. And and that's another part of it is, for different workloads, you may say. You know, I don't need a lot of storage. I just need a lot of compute. I've got a really cool example where we had this customer that had this high delete, uh, high delete requirement, and they actually bought a bunch of storage. And it turns out they needed more compute, and I'll show you what they did. But it's it's highly flexible. You're absolutely right, there, Chris. You could do that. So again, this is that that services node. Again, we think this is going to make a big difference, especially for our customers who are not familiar with. Load balancing, it's a new concept to them. So we've seen customers struggle with this, right? It's a new concept. We've also seen them struggle with things like SSL certificates, right? The, the idea that I create a self-signed cert and then I've got to go out and, and <coughs> put that certificate in the trusted root store of all my machines to have it trusted. This makes it easier, right? It walks you through creating a high availability group. Um, you're able to set QoS on IP rate limiting. And then again, optionally, it can be that admin node as well for an all appliance grid. So it makes Installation a lot simpler, right? It's literally going to ask you, what's the host name you want to have? And then it will say, give me an SSL certificate if you're going to get one from VeriSign. Or it will go ahead and make a self-signed one for you, and then you can take that certificate and then give it to your other applications so they'll trust it. So this is kind of a deep dive. Um, again, because we're a software-defined object store, 
all these features are available as a VM or as a container, right? So you don't have to buy our hardware to get this feature. Mm -hmm. And again, of course, you can just go with an F5 or an HA proxy if that's what you prefer. Um, so we're able to support multiple virtual IPs, right? So you create a, an HA group that has a virtual IP, multiple IPs on a single uh, grid instance. We have a firewalled interface that you can expose that interface to an untrusted network. It'll essentially just you know, lock that interface down to 443 or, or the port you choose. And then you've got also the ability to create an HA group for our admin nodes. So within Storage Grid, you have multiple admin nodes. And in the past, you, know, you would have like you know, sgadmin.netapp.com. And if that node went down, you'd have to say, oh, I need to go sgadmin2.netapp.com. Now I can create an HA group for my admin nodes that gives me a single URL for my, uh, for my tenants and for my admins to go in and do their administrative tasks. Uh, so again, a lot of this is about simplicity, right? It just makes it simpler for our customers to consume and do things that for some of the customers we're not that familiar with.